Howdy, I'm David Pollack, and the first thing I'm going to talk about is why the lab coat. So there was a, a Twitter thing going on, and uh, Fogus was talking about, I want a job where I can wear a lab coat, and then Sirius Pony was talking about the difference between wearing a turtleneck and a lab coat, and my kids love Phineas and Ferb. Who here know Phineas and Ferb? Yeah, okay, good. So, you know, there's Heinz Doofenshmirtz. And so the backstory of me wearing a lab coat, a black turtleneck, uh, creased jeans, and lace shoes is I lost a bet. Um, I'm also, like, absolutely obsessed with spreadsheets. I've written a couple of commercial ones in my life, and kind of a lot of what I want to do is kind of push business logic as close to business users as possible. And I think a lot of what gets lost in us as developers is the translation of business needs to business use cases to uh, designs to code to implementation and you know there's there's a lot of telephone there and a lot of stuff gets lost and so kind of the mad scientist in me kind of wants to to bring that business logic as close to users as possible so you know I've, I've been doing that with spread or did that with spreadsheets back in the 90s I've been kind of trying to get back to that place you know, it's kind of like, you know, Sam left the lost island and he had to get back. It's, it's like that. So I've been doing Lyft and Scala for seven years. I've recently found Clojure and been playing around with that. And I've got a set of Clojure libraries called Plu that I've been working on. Um, I'm also trained as a lawyer and my brain was kind of warped that way. Um, I recently, or this week, we announced Brick Alloy, which is a consulting firm with me and four other people. Um, two of whom are Lyft committers. One commits to or runs a project called Dexy, which is the absolute best way to do um, documentation and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, should take a look at it. Um, and we basically deliver cloud systems that drive business success. So let's get to the heart of the matter because I have 40 minutes and I've already wasted two of them. Um, <laughs> so. Ultimately, server push is um, a subset of a bigger problem. And the bigger problem is how do, we, how do we do stuff across address spaces? So in computing, a lot of what we look at is stuff within our own address space. And with the exception of Erlang, almost every other language kind of says, well, you know, there's my address or there's a local address space and there's everybody else. And there's very, very little semantics that we have and even fewer good semantics that we have for dealing with this stuff across address spaces. Yet these days, it's the vast majority of what we do. And you know, the, the problem falls, uh, boils down into transport. How do, we get, how do we get the bits across address spaces? Marshalling, what are the bits? And then the semantics of our program. So you know, we've got a program running on two sides and two different address spaces. How do we kind of deal appropriately with um, the program on either one of those across either one of those address spaces? You know, yes, we can write a REST endpoint for every single thing, and we can write a REST call for every single thing. But you know, that's many, many, many lines of boilerplate multiplied by many, many, many other things that kind of starts really weighing on and unbalancing the whole software project because it's not, a, you know, many of our software projects are not about the business logic. They're about the, yes, I'm getting back to that business logic, the BL term. It's not about the business logic, it's about the transport and it's about the marshalling. So let's talk about transport first. You know, it's like you use HTTP unless there's a darn good reason not to. So if you're going across address spaces, you're going to be doing it with HTTP. Why? Because it traverses firewalls, yay, and because it's got a lot of understood sem semantics. And you know, yeah, if you're talking to your local database, unless it's React, you're going to be using some local wire protocol. And you know, if you're talking to your message queue, it's most likely going to be over a wire protocol. But almost anything else you want to do, just use HTTP. Um, the bigger issue is marshalling, and you know it's like the clown car image because you know marshalling data, especially OO data, is really, really, really a sad, silly joke. Um, you know, and if you think about why marshalling OO data is particularly sad and silly, 
It's because OO is a combination of code and data that are supposed to kind of go with each other. Except when you're going across address spaces, they don't go with each other. And even when you, know, when you go across address spaces with your code and your data, um, even if you're running the same, nominally the same code across the address spaces, at some point you're going to have versioning problems because something in address space A is going to be ver running version 1.2 and address space B is running version 1.3. So unless you actually move the bit bytes that represent the code across the address spaces, making method invocations on your objects after they've crossed the address space is wrong. It doesn't work. So I think you, know, you really want to have a semantic about your cross address space um, stuff that doesn't involve code because your code really is going to be different across the address spaces. And so Erlang really recognizes that, and, um, but they do allow you to marshal functions as part as a parameter in your data, but it's like special built into Beam magic stuff that does the marshaling. Nobody else has that. You know, JavaScript, we've got JSON. Why has JSON become the way that we do everything? Because, you know, it works most of the time. It's kind of like HTTP. Yeah, it does what I need it to do, so let's move on. Um, closure script or closure and closure script also have particularly nice, slightly richer um, ways of marshaling data. So if you're not using Erlang or um, closure, use JSON. So the next thing is, how do you deal with your program semantics? Who here has ever done J2EE and RMI? Ooh, good. Oh, no, sorry, too many people raised their hand. But you know, it was really ugly. And the ugly thing about it was that you didn't know. So you're making a call, you're invoking a method on some remote thing, and you know, Java is all about having mutable objects. So you serialize your mutable objects across address spaces, except some of them can't really, and so you know, your remote code then mutates something, and that mutation isn't necessarily remoted back to you. <laughs> You've got the junior developer who doesn't understand that the cost of doing a remote call is you know, many, many, many orders of magnitude higher than doing a local method invocation. So just having very, very simple things in your code that denote a remote endpoint versus a local endpoint is kind of sort of valuable. So you think about Scala's actors and the ACA actors and you know, the actor paradigm. The actor paradigm says to, it's like a big bang, it's a big exclamation point that says this, the execution characteristics of this endpoint are going to be different, expect them to be different. So you, know, you don't usually put, you don't usually have nested within um, eight levels of loops a message send to an actor. You know, you, you, that's the little bang there is like a little indication that, ah, oh, you know what, maybe I should collect the data up and send it over in a larger batch rather than having 20,000 um, message sends. Um, another way of doing program semantics, which is a way that I think most of us are used to doing them these days, is <coughs> to hand roll them on every call. So, you know, I want to go across address spaces, so I'll just make a rest call to my endpoint, and the rest call to my endpoint, and I'll, like, you know, hang out there and consume a thread, or maybe have, if I'm doing Node, I'll have my callback function that continues the computation, and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, those are syntactically sugared with uh, the likes of futures and, you know, uh, promises and a bunch of other stuff. But at the end of the day, what we have is we have this hand rolled per invocation nastiness. And you know, that doesn't work real well. It's not scalable. Once again, it puts a lot of our programming effort and our programming brains on the side of, okay, how do I marshal this stuff? How do I make that call rather than, yes, I'm invoking a service that's, that's not part of my address space, but that really shouldn't be materially harder than dealing with something that is in my address space. So you know, we've got answers or we've got semantics that we've tried. Uh, futures and actors and promises, channels, queues, but you know, none of them feel quite right. Um, and you know, there's also stuff as we marshal across HTTP, and we're starting to get into the 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 reason for the talk, is that HTTP it has a lot of interesting hidden gotchas, especially if you're talking from the browser. So there's a limited number of browser to server connections, and this is to the name server. So you know what, if you've got a bunch of REST code in your browser, 
let's say you've got, you know, you load up a page and the page has 14 different components on the page and each of the 14 different components wants to go and recall data from the server and get its current state and that sort of thing. You've got 14 connections and depending on your browser, you, you're only allowed between one and eight of those 14 connections. So you block, and what happens when you block? Well, you know, if you're just blocking the other requests, that's not the worst thing in the world, but if you're blocking the downloading of an image or more JavaScript, then you've basically really hosed the user experience until the data is satisfied from the server. Um, and you know, that it, it usually bites people when you go into production, because each of the individual modules kind of sort of works the right way, and when you're doing it in the local LAN where you have, you know, seven millisecond response time, it all kind of, you know, just flows onto your screen. So when you're doing the demo, everybody's like, woo, yeah, that's great. But then you've got, you know, the vagaries of the real internet, and you've got um, 250 millisecond latency, and you've got drop packets, and you've got um, proxies that do HTTP retries, and the proxies themselves are unreliable. So the proxy may say that the thing failed, but the server actually re returned a response. So you retry, and if your call is an item potent, then you've just like caused a double update, and yeah, people are nodding their heads going, ah, yeah, I remember that one. <laughs> um, and on top of it all, you really can't trust what's on the wire. The wire lies, and part of, part of my like, upbringing is security. So you as a developer, when you're writing that nice REST endpoint, you have to basically go, okay, somebody's making a REST call, and I've got to you know, make sure that their credentials are right, and blah, 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 because every single HTTP request can be a lie, and very many of them are. So the key goals that we want for our cross-address space stuff is we want kind of native-ish, lightweight semantics. So we don't want to go all the way over to the RMI side of the field, which is, hey, you don't know whether this is local or remote, and I'm not going to tell you, unless you go with a Hungarian method, which is you know, underscore remote for every <laughs> RMI call. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to have eight lines of make this request, here's my promise, here's what to do at the end of my promise, and you know, yada, 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 because that code also becomes um, what is it, uh, callback hell, or what's the current name for that thing? Um, the other thing is that we want to treat our um, inter-address space requests very much like we treat TCP IP. So you, know, you open up a TCP connection, and you don't really know that your packets are being split up, and you don't really know, and you don't really care when you have retries up until a certain point. What you want is you want an ordered stream of bytes. I'm going to send you an ordered stream of bytes, and I'm going to receive an ordered stream of bytes. And most of the time, I don't care whether there are retries. Most of the time, I don't care whether there are failures. Only when they go above a certain threshold should I really care. And as app developers, we want the same sort of thing when we're, se when we're sending data across address spaces. Yeah, we want to know that there can be failures, and we want to be able to deal with those failures. But in the normal course of events, that was, shouldn't have been a joke. Um, in the normal course of events, we don't want to have to send a little chunk of data and say, did that, did that get through? Is that okay? We want some underlying transport to be able to deal with that. Um, and one of the things that I've, I've kind of, I developed with Lyft early on and has worked very, very well is globally unique identifier. So we started off with globally unique identifiers for functions on the server that relate to actions in the browser. So you know you push a button in the browser and it invokes a function on the server. And there are a whole bunch of real nice advantages to that. One of the advantages to the globally unique identifier is you don't have to marshal data that's related to the button push into the browser because you might be exposing data, which is a security leak. You might be giving tamperable data, which is a security problem. You're also transmitting a lot more information over from the server to the browser than you have to. And with Scala and with Clojure and you know, a bunch of other languages, when you can have um, a function that has scope and the function will be applied, invoked, called, whatever your function making happen semantics are with the parameter that you get from the browser. So the really nice thing is that GUIDs are like refs. You know, they're references. They're, they're a pointer across address space 
to that thing that you care about without having to expose the innards of that thing that you care about across the wire. Um, it's a function, it's actually nice and functional because you don't know what's going on inside that thing, but you know that when you apply the GUIDed function with the particular parameters, something that you wanted to happen will. It also feels a lot like actors or channels, which is you send something to an identifier and action takes place. Also, GUIDs are very, very easy to serialize. Yes, they're just a nice, happy string. Um, the only problem or challenge with them is that they cause GC garbage collection problems because you want to make sure that you know that the GUIDs that are still being referred to on your web page shouldn't be GC'd out of memory on your server, but once they cease to be, and this becomes a bigger issue when you have single page applications, once they cease to be referenced on the browser, you want them to be GC'd on the server because you know, when you have a function on the server that closes over scope, that closure over scope is um, something that retains memory, and you know, if you have a list of 1,000 customer records that is part of your function that's going to be executed, you want to get rid of that thing as soon as possible because you don't want 50,000 functions that close over 1,000 customer records <laughs> floating around on your server. The other thing is, and this gets back into kind of where, where you have the balance of vagaries, you want to have some sort of confirmed delivery and delivery once. So when you send something to the server, when your application calls that, send the, invoke this thing, and you know, you know it's being invoked across the wire, um, you want to make sure that it gets there, only gets there once, and only causes the effect once, because very, 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 very few um, operations in our um, world are idempotent. Yes, gets are, nothing else is, get over it. Uh, <laughs> um, so in Lyft, we've actually done a lot of nifty stuff on both sides of the HTTP transaction where the client and the server have both GUIDs and clocks that are associated with each um, potential request, and when the request is sent over the wire, uh, when the request is sent from the client to the server, um, if the server has seen that um, globally unique identified request in the past, it won't reprocess it. And what Lyft does is it actually keeps the answer around. So if it gets multiple requests because you've got a proxy in the middle and the proxy has basically said, oh, it's told the browser, no, I didn't send that request. The browser retry code automatically retries. Yeah, Lyft has a bunch of browser retry code. So the browser retry code, it goes, oh, I got a 500. I'm going to resend that request. But on the other side of the world, the proxy has actually sent that request over to your application. Your application has processed it. So when it gets the second request, what you want is you want the answer that was generated the first time around. And Lyft does that automatically and under the covers. It's only when there are five retry failures that you, you get, your application gets notified that, you know, really something is, I've, I've tried this five times. I've done um, a logarithmic back off on the request stuff. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to try it again. I'm going to tell you that I failed. Um, on the server side, when you want to push something to the client, there is a queue for pushing stuff to the client. So, you know, um, if you go through, if you're doing stuff on a mobile device, you go through a tunnel in a train and you are disconnected from the server for 30 seconds, a bunch of push events have queued up. The client has a clock, a version number of uh, what it's expecting for each component on the page. When it reconnects, it says, okay, here's the components that are, that are expecting potential push information. Here's the vector clock for each component. Give me anything that's newer than the vector clock. And so if there's nothing newer than the vector clock, we have a nice um, long pole. And if there's um, something newer than the vector clock, the HTTP request is satisfied immediately. The changes are applied to each of the components on the page. And then the HTTP request is reopened. So, you know, push. How do we do that? It used to be kind of hard with, to do Comet because you'd have to have a long pole. You'd have to have a bunch of the correct long pole semantics which I kind of alluded to just a minute ago. Um, it's marginally easier with WebSockets, but at the end of the day, you're still crossing the web, you're still crossing address-based boundaries, so you have to deal with a lot of the crossing address-based boundary issues. 
So let me dive into Lyft. Let's see, how am I doing time-wise? Oh, darn, I'm halfway done. Uh, Got to talk faster. So it's my Scala libraries. I started building them about six and a half years ago. They are the most mature, best maintained libraries in Scala land. Why do I say this? Because we have a much better continuous build and test environment. We have better cross builds than any of the other libraries. Um, Lyft, in addition to being a web framework, does actors and futures and monads and JSON and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, but we mostly don't publish that because, or publicize that because people associate it with a web framework and we tried to change the brand once and didn't work, so eh. But we do have the best server push in the industry. So we have Ajax, which is a single channel. So even though you might have multiple Ajax requests coming from the browser to the server, they're all in queued and they're only sent over a single HTTP channel. Why do we do this? To avoid, browser, uh, to avoid um, session or connection starvation. The, the server push is a single HTTP long poll. Even though you might have 20 components on the page, they're all multiplexed over a single HTTP connection. Um, it, I built Lyft in the era of IE6, and it worked well to do multiplayer games in IE6, uh, which is good. Um, and in Lyft, the server is mostly cognizant of HTTP, which back set the six and a half, seven years ago was the right way to go. Today is absolutely the wrong way to go. Between Angular and Knockout, don't ever let your, you know, mothers don't let your children write HTTP on the server. Um, okay, that didn't quite, wasn't quite as funny as I'd hoped. So Lyft 3, I'm making it more data focused. So the server knows a lot more about the data and a lot less about the page. Because, you know, that's the way the world is going and quite frankly, um, well, it's just a smart way to go. Um, but interestingly, as we've been making the transition to a much more data-centric model, there's been no, no change at all to the underlying transport. So the underlying way that Lyft communicates from a browser to the server or from the server to the browser has not changed since um, we've been going for a more data-centric model, which actually makes me super duper ultra mega happy because it's like, okay, we at least got one thing right. Um, so let me get into chat and I'll show you a demo of the chat stuff. Let me go over to my browser. So here's my Lyft chat and I can go hello world and click on the chat button and our browser updates. And if we go over to our other browser, we can see that both of our browsers are updating, chatting back and forth. And you know, one of Lyft's nice things is you can uh, do the wrong thing. Um, and the right thing happens. Um, so let's go look through some of the code that makes that happen. So on the server side, we're actually defining, um, we're creating two different um, endpoints. Uh, Lyft, has, uh, Lyft 3 has this thing called streaming promises. So what you do is you create an endpoint in the browser. The um, JavaScript in the browser can call one of these functions. When it calls one of these functions, it will get a streaming promise back. A streaming promise is a standard promise except that it can be fulfilled. The, the then function can be called multiple times. And so what we do is we um, say the start function will take a string as a parameter and one of the nice things about having a well-typed language like Scala is we say oh okay when we get our data blob back from the browser we're going to try to unmarshal it as a string and you can also unmarshal it to um, case classes because Lyft JSON does particularly nice marshaling and unmarshaling to and from case classes and we will um, invoke the function pushystream.stream to generate our streaming promise back to the browser. And when we get a chat, when the chat function is called, it takes a string as a parameter as well, and we will push that data into pushystream, and then we'll just return an empty stream, which basically says, okay, I don't care what, you know, you, you'll have the end function called on your um, client side stream. So let's look at pushy stream for a minute. It's an object, by the way, don't do this in the real world. It consumes threads and has all kinds of nasty side effects. But um, we have a stream, which in Scala land is basically a, um, it's an unbounded collection 
that uh, will block and wait until new elements are added to it. So we basically continually update the stream by trying to take from a linked blocking queue. So if there's nothing in the linked blocking queue, we won't be able to take anything. Once something gets added to the linked blocking queue, it gets appended to the end of the stream. So this is the entirety of the server side. On the client, we have some HTML. It's all Angular JS. So we basically say repeat X in chats, and we create an LI for each of the chat elements that we have in our controller. And we have um, a model line, so that what that does is that actually creates an input field, associates it with the model element line. And um, when we click on our button, it calls the send function. Boom, that's it. And our Angular controller looks like, okay, our chats are an array. We seed the array with the string welcome. Our line is a blank string. Uh, the send function basically calls our server funks dot chat, which was populated from the server, with the line, and then resets the line to blank. So you click on the send button, it sends the message on off, and then resets the line to blank. And we do the start thing, and for each of our messages received from the um, server, we basically push the new message, the new, new chat line into chats. And what winds up happening is AngularJS, because it's got two-way, I hate using the phrase MVC, um, two-way MVC, you wind up basically updating your array. The screen is redrawn, the stuff that's, um, the HTML is redrawn to reflect the new value and uh, the user sees their chat element. So that's it. So we didn't have to really think a lot about the vagaries of either how we're pushing data, how we're making our cross address space call in, uh, from the browser to Lyft, to our Lyft chat application, nor are we thinking much about how we're um, satisfying our promise um, of the chats. But we know that when, as the promise is satisfied, as the new elements are um, brought into the stream, we just get them. So that's Lyft. What's Plu? So there, who here has played Colossal Caves Adventure? A hollow voice says Plu. It was a very not taken word on the internet. You know, not taken words are. <laughs> Plus, I used to play Colossal Caves Adventures for hours on end. I actually had a hand drawn map of the colossal kit and um, wasting time. Um, the two things I'm doing with, with Plu are having a purely Angular JS focused um, framework. So basically it's closure script and closure, but I don't care about the DOM. I don't want to know about HTML. All I care about in Plu is data. Now the other thing that I care about in Plu the other thing I care about is not just pushing data from the client, uh, from the server to the client, or taking data from the client to the server, but I also care about doing, being able to do analysis of data. So being able to say, okay, you've got data on your back end, whether it's in a, a Hadoop cluster or whether it's on a, um, distributed across file systems on 30 different machines, I want to be able to take and condense that information and present it into the browser in a unified way so that the users are you the the business users the business logic is identical semantics whether you're dealing with the stuff on the back end or whether you're playing with your data in the browser and you're never going across http and by the way you know you can do a couple hundred thousand rows of data in a in a browser today in firefox or chrome i mean the the javascript optimizers are so good that they can like look, you know, you've got 100,000 rows of data that's identical. You get a very efficient C data structure that represents those. You've got um, a bunch of business logic that's run over and over again. That'll be jitted, it'll be fast. So it's really, really, really cool what can be done in the browser today. Um, so the other thing is who here went to Rich's core async talk? Um, 
So core async is all about messages between two endpoints. And Rich had this uh, visual of like a uh, um, conveyor belt. And, you know, you put something on the conveyor belt, and then something else takes it off the conveyor belt and does something with it. And core async is a conveyor belt. So what it just does is it disconnects the guys that are putting stuff on the conveyor belt from the folks that are taking stuff off the conveyor belt. And the thing for me is that core async, you know, being able to put something on the conveyor belt and then having something else take it off the conveyor belt should be across address spaces as well as being inside address spaces. So when you're making a core async call, it has enough of a notion that you're doing something that's not going to return immediately, not going to be part of your call stack, that it's not RMI-ish. But um, it also has the nice semantics of it's going to happen in the future, and if I pass a channel and wait for a response on the channel that I pass, I'll get an answer. Or if I'm smart, I'll do an alt, and I'll either get an answer or a timeout, which is you know, kind of whoo, the right way of doing things. Um, and it can be synchronous or asynchronous send and receive, um, and I'm using it as a substrate for Plu. So getting back to our chat example, let me show you the... Um, let me show you the Plu chat example. So, hello world, send, and we go over to our Chrome example, and we get howdy, and you know basically the same the same thing that we just saw in the Lyft example, except this time it's in pure closure. There's no JavaScript to be seen. Um, the HTML is actually identical, so I'm not going to show that. Um, this is a uh, closure script I uh, liberally borrowed from a library called Clang, which is the closure, angular, bridge thingy, and you know, mucked with it a little bit. By the way, is, does anybody know if the Clang author is here? Because I'd like to buy him a beer. He's awesome. Um, so what we do is we set our scope for chats to um, a JavaScript version of an array. We set our line to a string. We create our scope. Um, we create our send function. And we capture the message, which is the current line. And we capture it because when you go into a Go block enclosure, um, that's going to happen some other time. And in the next um, line over here, we're actually setting the, um, we're setting the line variable, the line property back to zero, uh, back to blank. So we don't know whether this Go block is going to um, occur before or after. So before we enter the Go block, we want to capture our variable into a message. And then we send to our server channel um, a message that contains message. OK, pretty much the same thing that we saw in, um, uh, in the Lyft example, except it's a little bit more data-y, because we're telling what kind of message we're sending rather than just sending a string. And for those of you who are in the pedestal um, presentation just before mine, uh, the pedestal guy was basically, um, he had a verb, object-y kind of message format that he's going to be standardizing on. And I'll probably liberally borrow from that as well, because, well, you know, that's what we open source guys do. Uh, the other thing that we're going to do is we're going to create our own local channel called RC, our receive channel. We're going to send to our server a message to add RC to the list of listeners, to the list of channels that care about messages. And then we're going to hang out here and while true forever, uh, we're going to get chats from the server. And within the scope of Angular, we basically, when, when you update um, Angular variables or variables that Angular is watching, you want to say that you're going to do it within their scope so that they know to watch for the changes. And when they watch for the changes, then they update the UI for us. Um, we're going to uh, grab our chat within the scope. We're going for each of the chats. We're going to push the chat into our array, our JavaScript array, and boom, we're done. And so what this does is updates our array, and Angular does its magic, and it redraws. And the nice thing is that we haven't had to cross a language barrier here. We haven't had to do the mental shift of, okay, I was doing Scala or Clojure or Java or Ruby, and now I have to do JavaScript. And you know, it's just there's, there's a cost, at least for my brain, 
of making that shift. Um, Closure Script is absolutely beautiful because you don't have to worry about the making that shift mentally. And the other thing that's really nice is your data structures are the same. So we created a data structure over here, it gets serialized, and it gets sent over. And the one bit of thing that I had to add to actually make this work to get it across the HTTP boundary is I had to create a serialization uh, routine for channels. So if you have a channel and you, want to, and you send it across the serialization boundary, what it does is it creates a GUID for that channel. Um, if, if the channel is a local channel, it creates a GUID for the channel and stores the GUID locally. And then it sends the GUID over to the other side. When the other side deserializes, the other side says, oh, I have a thing that should be a channel. I'm going to create a channel proxy on my side. And so whenever somebody sends something to the channel proxy, I'm going to create a message that goes over the pipe, that gets pushed over the pipe the other way. And the channel on the other side will then receive that message and do its appropriate thing. So we have the, the magic rich hickey um, conveyor belt thing going both ways. And the only thing is that there's like, a little x-ray machine that goes, oh, you're a channel in this thing that I'm serializing, and therefore I'm going to treat you a little bit differently. I'm going to make your bytes look a little bit different. And oh, when I have that channel come back across, oh, it's a channel that I recognize, so I'll just put that into the deserialized message. And so it be, it's the same data structure on both sides. It's a channel on both sides, except it's a good on the wire. So what does our server look like? Well, while true, we listen for our server channel. If we have an add message, we append to our listeners, and we send our listeners all of our chat messages. And if we have a chat message, then we um, add the chat message to the end of our list of chat messages, and for all of our listeners, we send the message back to them. Boom, that's it. So, you know, we're not thinking about anything other than sending the messages to this channel. And the interesting thing is that I didn't have the cross HTTP thing working when I first did this um, demo. So all this code was actually living on in the browser. So it was all in closure script. I was able to fully debug the closure script code and literally move the closure script code from the server block, um, from the client block to the server block. And it functioned the same way because it was a channel. And I'm just serializing data and sending it across the channel. And the fact that the channel was in a different address space didn't really matter, which is pretty darn cool. Now, I haven't, got, I haven't quite figured out how to do a, um, uh, send failures or receive failures yet, but that's kind of bubbling around in my brain to say, OK, you know, what happens when we've, we've tried to retry this thing and that sort of thing? How do we notify um, the channel overlords that there has been a failure? I don't know that one yet, but I will get there. So where am I time-wise? OK, I've got a few minutes, and I'm going to show you the spreadsheet Nader. Or using the high-end Sturfenschmerz voice, the spreadsheet Nader. It will allow me to take over all the business logic in the tri-state area. <laughs> Good, I got a laugh out of that one. People didn't run for the doors. So uh, you'll see that we have a grid here. And I'm going to basically make a copy of the grid or fork the grid. And one of the things that you can see is that if I change data in the top part of the grid, so if I, ah, <laughs> that was the Heinz Doofenshmirtz, ah, how did that happen? Well, at least it was, uh, going to the New York Times. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I changed my age to, uh, yeah, I'm 35. Yeah, that's a ticket. And you'll see that the grid updates. OK, that's pretty cool. But what happens if we want to add business logic here? Let's, let's say we want to do some calculations. So what we do is we say our age is actually, uh, um, we'll subtract 10 years from our age and click on call. And so what this does is this actually, whoa, right. because subtraction is not commutative. So we basically subtract 10 from all of the ages. OK, that's pretty cool. And you know, let's, uh, let's make sure that our uh, 
name is really important. So to uppercase. Hello. Oh, to uppercase. No wonder. So basically what we've done is we've taken our source data and we've run a series of transformations on the source data. So we've transformed it by saying, yeah, we want an age column and we want a name column. And the nifty thing about what's going on here is this is actually all um, closure script. It, I actually did some nifty stuff to basically say, okay, because data is also, uh, because my code is data, I'm going to add a couple of semantics to my flavor of uh, plu closure script to say if you have a colon, um, uh, if you basically have a keyword here, we're just gonna run this function and create the column for that keyword. And I also replace the uh, percent with a, um, with it as a, well, I couldn't get percent working. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, Anyway, so you know, basically what we've done is uh, we send this over to the server, the server sends back JavaScript, and that's the last time the server knows about any of the changes. So when we make changes up here, so if we change our, if we change my age back to, um, ah, yeah, sorry. It's a focus issue, focus, must focus. Um, so when we change my age here to, you know, I have my birthday, so I turned 50, and, oh, interesting, oh yeah, so it worked, so, you know, we basically changed my age from, um, 50 to 40, we subtracted from my age. You know, there's also some nifty stuff that we can do here. We can say um, colon total age is sum, and this will give us a total of all the ages down at the bottom. We can also say colon hash filter and what are we going to filter on? We're going to say um, age to number is greater than eight. Oops. Uh, oh yeah, thank you. Hmm, that didn't work well. It worked. It, it worked in the hotel room. <laughs> but the nifty thing is that we we do the one round trip to the server because um, Closure Script is not yet self hosting, and we then get a blob of JavaScript back. And the blob of JavaScript is then applied for each of the changes that are made to the upper grid the same JavaScript is applied to the lower grid to create the resulting grid. And the really nice thing there is that, you know, you, you're not doing your computation, you're not moving your computation or your data around. The server, does, no, the thing that generates the JavaScript from the closure script no longer has to know about your data. So you can move your program as JavaScript around your network, and a program as JavaScript is, you know, a couple hundred K compressed a lot less. So it's a lot easier to move that around your network, apply it to a bunch of data, and then pull the applied data into some place where you can coalesce it. Anyway, so that's, uh, that's it. Let me go back and do my last slide, which is any questions? By the way, that's my dog, Archer. He's the friendliest dog in the world. In the back. How does it compare with single? I have no idea what signal R is, so I can't tell you. Sorry. Okay, thanks a lot, guys. Sorry for going over.